Tonight's program is brought to you by the National Archives and the Records Administration, our parent organization, with additional support from the Gerald Ford Presidential Foundation. Tonight's session is one of my very favorite features of the educational programs that we offer here at the library and museum because we are hosting another lecture by the winner of the Gerald Ford Distinguished Journalism Prize for reporting on the presidency. There's also an award for reporting on national defense. This award has been given annually for 24 years at a June event at the National Press Club in Washington. While the stipend for the award is funded by the Gerald Ford Presidential Foundation, selection of the winner is made by an independent panel of five journalists and faculty at various universities. I've been pleased to hear from various winners that they view the award as the Academy Awards of Journalism. Kind of a, kind of a nice honor. In winning the 2011 prize for reporting on the presidency, Stephen Thoma joins the distinguished company of prior winners, including Ben Feller of the Associated Press, who spoke here last April, Ken Walsh of US News and World Report, Peter Baker of the New York Times, Bob Woodward of the Washington Post, Michael Isikoff of Newsweek, Michael Duffy of Time, and Jackie Combs of the Wall Street Journal. That's rather a distinguished group, I think you'd agree. Stephen Thoma is the senior White House correspondent for McClatchy Newspapers, which publishes more than 30 newspapers around the country, from the Anchorage Daily News in Alaska to the Miami Herald in Florida. Mr. Thoma has covered Washington since 1987 and has traveled throughout the US and 40 countries to cover President Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and now President Obama. In 2011, he was awarded the Ford Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency during the year 2010. The judges for the award stated that he demonstrates a clear understanding that not the first year, but the second year in office for a new president is a more accurate measure of his leadership, his management of the complexities of the federal executive offices, his exercise of constitutional powers, his way of communicating with the American people, and his standing in the public mind. They also noted that his writing was lightened with engaging inventiveness. In addition, we'll have to find out more about that tonight. In addition to the Ford Award, Mr. Thoma received awards from the White House Correspondents Association for campaign coverage in 2000 and the National Press Club's Award for Best Regional Reporting in 1994. He is a newly elected board member of the White House Correspondents Association and will serve as its president in 2013. A native of Chicago, Mr. Thoma's bio states that he still cheers for the Bears, Bulls, and White Sox. We want him to know that here in Ann Arbor, sir, we cheer for the Wolverines, Tigers, and Lions. Mr. Thoma has previously visited 11 of the 12 presidential libraries that exist within the National Archives, but he clearly saved the very best for last. Please join me in welcoming him to his first visit to the Ford Presidential Library. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elaine. Thank you to the Ford uh, Presidential Library for hosting me. I have to point out, I have been to the Ford Museum in Grand Rapids. This, of course, is the only one that split the museum and library, so I did have to get to this one. And I, I'm delighted to be here, particularly to talk a little bit about the incumbent president and, uh, and have dinner with Elaine and uh, some of the other people from the library. Uh, she mentioned the, the judges uh, in judging my contest entries uh, commented on my inventiveness. I don't want you to think that I invented the news. Uh, I hope they think I was inventive in the way I presented it or analyzed it. Uh, I know a lot of people talk particularly about the media nowadays and the bias, all the bias in the media. So I'm not a columnist, I'm just a reporter, but I thought I'd explain to you up front a little bit about my biases so you know where I'm coming from. And I'll just lay it right on the table and tell you a little bit about how, what I think and how I think about some of these people. Uh, just a few of the ones I cover. Hillary Clinton, uh, I'll tell you what I think of her. On Take Your Kid to Work Day, when I took my son to the U.S. Senate, she stopped and was nice to my son. She is a great American. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, none of the other U.S. Senators stopped and talked to my son or the other four or five of us standing outside the Senate showing our sons and daughters around. She did. Once she did, all the rest of them did, too. <laughs> Joe Biden. When he was running for president, you might remember he ran, too. Uh, 
he was trying to get the media to talk to him. His press staff were very persistent, and none of us would interview Joe Biden. We were all talking to Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or John Edwards. So finally, his press secretary was a nice young woman. I said, all right, I'll, I'll interview Joe, and waited for him at the end of some uh, event in Iowa one day in the summer of uh, 07, and Biden came over and put me in a headlock. He's very tall, much taller than me, and he put me in a headlock and said, well, I'm not going to talk to you. And I said, okay, I'll put that down. I'm biased. I, that's a big negative. Well, last summer he had a party for the White House press corps at the vice president's mansion. He was nice to one of my other sons. <laughs> he spent five, ten minutes talking to my son, my then 11-year-old son. Okay, big positive. I'm biased. <laughs> Finally, the big man, Barack Obama. Now, the biggest thing about Barack Obama is he's a White Sox fan. As you heard in the introduction, I'm a White Sox fan. Uh, this guy's got a lot going for him. I have to, I'm not saying it filters into the way I cover the presidency, but that's a big factor. Now let's pause for a moment. You're probably a lot of your Detroit Tigers fans. You may, know, may have noticed the White Sox suck. Well, I think the commander-in-chief has very little responsibility for that, so I take that into the thing when I'm covering him. I hold him accountable for the White Sox. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, first, about my relationship, particularly with the president at press conferences, the most public way we interact with him. I've had some interesting interactions with the incumbent president that started with him apologizing to me. The next time, a couple times later, it had me apologizing to him. Then it had me apologizing to a big city. And finally, it had to do with me just getting a question and getting an answer. The first one was back uh, when he was just the president-elect, and uh, he was uh, announcing his transition team in Washington. And uh, one day, we showed up for the press uh, conference in a room much like this in a hotel, and there were assigned seats, and they were labeled. One side of the room were Cubs, the Chicago Cubs. They had the label. And the other side was White Sox, and everyone was assigned a seat. And I was in the Cubs section. Well, I wrote a pool report to the rest of my, my colleagues in the White House press corps because I got there early about how offended I was as a White Sox fan to be seated in a Cubs seat. Well, the Chicago papers had a lot of fun with that. The Chicago TV stations wrote stories about it. The next day, the president-elect had a press conference to announce, I think it was his budget team, and he called on me at the press conference, and he said, but before I ask Steve a question, I want to apologize to him. And he explained to the viewers and the rest of the press corps about this Cubs-White Sox thing. And he said, uh, and I quote, this is a part of the new way of doing business here. When we make mistakes, we admit them. So he got off to a good start that way. The second time, though, spin forward a couple press conferences later, we're in the East Room in the White House. Uh, my seat that time happened to be in the front row. They rotate the assigned seats for that. No Cubs or White Sox at the White House. And... Uh, uh, health care was being debated in Congress, and I had a good couple questions I wanted to ask him. Uh, and uh, I heard him call Steve, and the, the person from the staff with the microphone was right there, so I grabbed the microphone, I stood up, and I asked him what I thought was a good, tough question on health care. Uh, I asked him a follow-up question, and, uh, and I didn't get my first hint that something was wrong until he said, well, as you know, I'm going to be in your hometown tomorrow. Well, my, my hometown's Chicago. His, he was talking about the Cleveland Clinic, and I thought, there's something wrong here. A minute later, another Steve stood up and said, I'm from the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and he took my question. <laughs> well, the president uh, said, he just stood up, huh? Well, that's not fair. And he looked at me and said, shame on you. <laughs> well, I'm a little hard of hearing. I didn't hear him call on Steve Koff of the Cleveland Plain Dealer. I heard him call on Steve. I grabbed the question. So after that press conference, I had to go over to the West Wing and apologize to everyone on the staff, send the apology up the ladder. I told Robert Gibbs, the press secretary, I said, if your new health care plan covered hearing aids, we wouldn't have this problem. I would have heard the dang question. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I compounded the error. A lot of the papers there that night wanted to write little items on that. And uh, one young woman from the Washington Post asked me about it. And I said, I don't know what's more embarrassing, being identified as a as a knucklehead on national TV or, or being identified in a little label as being from Cleveland. Well, now the Cleveland papers had to weigh in on that. 
This was a big story. Cleveland radio, talk radio, TV, all did stories on what a jerk I was for offending Cleveland, so I had to apologize to Cleveland. Well, finally, it's been forward a couple more press conferences. Uh, last year, during the big oil spill in the Gulf, the president was under, under a lot of fire, and, uh, and uh, he came into the East Room for a press conference, and I, had, uh, I like all of us, had questions ready, and, and he called on Steve Thoma. Well, this time, I wasn't going to take any chances. I turned to uh, the woman sitting next to me, April Ryan. I said, did he really call on me? And she laughed. She knew what had happened before. And I turned to Ann Compton of ABC. I said, did he really? He's meanwhile waiting for me to stand up and ask my question. I'm asking everyone around me, did he really call on me? Well, I finally got my question in. I asked him what I thought was a pretty good question, a tough question. I got a good answer about whether he'd handle this well in his administration. And I, in the end, the Village Voice newspaper wrote a nice review of everyone who'd asked questions that day, and I, I liked theirs. They said, quote, McClatchy gets the first good resignation towards guilt from Obama in the room. Score for him. They also concluded at the end, they said, the ballzo of McClatchy shouldn't be underestimated. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I'm taking it as a compliment. So that's been my, my, the gist of my experiences with the president at press conferences, the main chance we get as a press corps to question him. I'm going to talk a little bit about both how the White House uh, works to get that message out, the message machine, I call it, of the White House, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how he does in particular, his skills and how good he's doing at getting his message out. That press conference is just the tip of the iceberg, a vast operation at the White House. It's been growing ever since... Richard Nixon was president. I don't know if you remember this, but there used to be a swimming pool on that site. You started by Franklin Roosevelt, used through John F. Kennedy. Nixon floored it over. He didn't want to use it. He used it to put the press. That's been the press briefing room ever since. Nixon also was the one, however, who started the new modern White House communications office. Not just a press secretary who'd answer questions, but a strategy. People who would start to think about a proactive way to get the president's message out. Uh, now what we've got is Barack Obama melding what started under Nixon and FDR as a press operation. It morphed into a, a new video operation, all kinds of people. They use this to navigate this changing media landscape to try to cut through the clutter of all 100 TV stations and Internet and online and newspapers to get their message out. It's very interesting. Bill Daly, the new White House chief of staff, is reading a book. He, he recommended to me and a colleague uh, called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. And he used it to illustrate in a conversation that people think differently now based on the Internet. And that's the way the White House thinks they have to acknowledge as they try to cut through this to get their message out to voters and, and people in the country. The Obama operation today has 69 people directly involved in communications. That is a 32% increase from the George W. Bush White House. It is a 46% increase from the Bill Clinton White House. That doesn't even count the communications and press people at the National Security Council, in the Vice President's office, or in all the cabinet departments that are political appointees picked by the President and his team. Every week they, they get on the phone and they confer about how to get the uniform message out. From that, what do they do? How do they do it? Well, the big thing right now they do is they tweet. That's what I, I just I was looking at my BlackBerry while I was waiting outside. I had 10 new tweets in the last hour from the White House. I don't read them all. They're a little short, as you know, tweets. All this really started last year during that oil spill, that Gulf of Mexico oil spill. That's when they really started to accelerate this strategy in the Obama White House. They were very scared of the storyline that was developing. I don't know if you remember in the first few days of that oil spill, the narrative was taking hold that the president wasn't in command, that he wasn't, he wasn't running the operation, he wasn't aggressive enough, he wasn't pushing British Petroleum, or BP rather, to, to clean this up and get going. And, and the very, very first tweet, uh, Twitter message from Robert Gibbs came uh, via Twitter. Now, as you know, Twitter and tweets have like a 24, 26 character limit. Now, you guys are all younger than I am. You probably know that better than I do. Uh, but that doesn't stop them. The very, one of the very first ones from the White House it was 24 characters, but it had a little link in it to an 11,000 uh, word report, 
with 73 mentions of how good the president was doing. So you just had to click on that little tweet and then open that up and you were flooded with information. It said that very first one, a busy day here, but the president has not taken his eyes off the BP spill. And then attached to it, you could link to White House photos of Barack Obama meeting with top aides in the Situation Room, giving orders, commands, getting briefings. As of today, Jay Carney, the new White House press secretary, has 238,000 followers to his Twitter account. They're getting direct feeds from him every day. That's up fourfold from a year ago. The White House generally has 2.4 million followers. That's up from a million eight just a year ago. The Twitter and tweets are just part of it, and, and, uh, but a growing part. And as, as the White House uh, staff point out, this didn't even exist when he ran for president. All this, that part of it is new to their social media strategy. Then there's email. I mean, you know, that old dinosaur of email. After the jobs bill speech he gave about 10 days ago to a joint session of Congress, my inbox had 56 emails from the White House. Used to be, you know, 10, 20 years ago, ancient history, a reporter would actually have to call people to get reaction to a president's speech, call senators, congressmen, whatever. Don't have to. The White House did it for us. They gave us a reaction, all favorable, from every senator they had, every governor that had a favorable reaction, every member of the House, every labor union, every think tank that had a favorable reaction was in my inbox immediately by email from the White House. Reporter didn't want it, didn't have to do any work. It was all there, packaged, ready for us to use. They use videos. Boy, do they use videos. Uh, the White House increasingly, this White House, bans uh, the cameras, the network cameras, from a lot of events. Uh, they never let the cameras in to the backstage when things are happening. Increasingly, they ban them from uh, Oval Office events, even bill signings. You remember, of course, that when the president took office and, uh, and they, they uh, flubbed the line, the chief justice got the line, so they decided to reenact the swearing in just to be safe. They didn't let any journalists in the room. They videoed and photographed that themselves. Uh, in the case of the oil spill, uh, when the president, when he made his first trip down there, he took a White House video team along with the networks. Two days later, by, two day, by May 4th, WhiteHouse.gov, their own web page, had their own video recap. Now, this is a video recap produced by the White House, not by journalists. So needless to say, it's all favorable. It all makes him look good. By two days after that, it, had, it was rolling out the new version of its own video show, West Wing Week. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's been out for a year. It comes out once a week. They put it out on web. It's very catchy. It's, quote, your guide to everything that's happening at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. About six minutes each week, a lot of backstage video, the kind of things you don't get from ABC or uh, Fox. You know, they don't have that access. It's the president behind stage uh, before he gives a speech, joking with a world leader in a meeting, giving orders, listening and talking to people. Very, very flashy, very well packaged, and very favorable. It's 100% favorable. And then there's photos. Again, this White House increasingly is banning photographers from uh, events but letting their own photographers and their own growing staff of photographers. Uh, for instance, again, back to the oil leak, when they were very concerned about losing control of this story, uh, one of the very first pictures they sent out was a picture of the president getting briefed. They distribute these by tweet, by attachments to these Twitter feeds, by Flickr, whitehouse.gov, by email, now, these, these pictures are taken by uh, people. Pete Souza, I don't know if you've heard his name. He's the official White House photographer. Chuck Kennedy, uh, who's a former colleague of mine, uh, worked for McClatchy and Knight Ritter uh, before that. Uh, these are uh, terrific photographers. They're former journalists, but they're not journalists. And they don't pick what pictures get sent out. They take a lot, but the press office picks it. And they pick these pictures for a purpose, which is to make the president look good, to communicate his message. There's no critical uh, judgment in there. Uh, for instance, this is a Pete Souza photograph about a year, year and a half ago of the president editing a text of a major speech. This picture was released by the White House and was seized upon. A number of blogs uh, wrote about how this well this made the president look, that he was doing all this personal editing, very hands-on, 
that this was a brilliant man, uh, and it was obviously he was uh, very uh, detail-oriented. The problem with it is we don't know what the other pictures were on the reel. We don't know what's just off camera. We don't actually know that the president wrote that stuff. The White House told us that. There was no journalist in the room, no photojournalist, no, no reporter, no critical eye challenging any of that. Uh, as a journalist, I have a problem with that. Here's a classic case. Back after Ronald Reagan was shot in 1981, the White House photographer took this photograph, which was released by the White House with great fanfare because they wanted to show the country and the world the president was not as badly injured and was in, you know, in great shape. This photo was edited or cropped by the White House to crop out the IV tubes and the big IV bottles, which are just off frame. It's been written about uh, because there wasn't a journalist in the room. Now they just did it again. I'm sorry, they didn't do that again. They didn't, we don't know what they did. Uh, the president uh, last month was on vacation in Martha's Vineyard. At the same time, there was a hurricane bearing down on the East Coast, uh, particularly in, on the East Coast where I live. It was a, a big story. And there were a lot of questions about what the president was doing. Um, one of the, well, clearly he was talking to people every day in the mornings about hurricane preparedness and what the government was doing. But in the afternoons, he was playing golf. And they were very concerned about that. Uh, they were so concerned one day, uh, he saw that there was a photographer from the Boston Globe staking out the golf course uh, on Martha's Vineyard. He has to play courses where the media have access, unlike in Washington where he can go to Andrews Air Force Base or Fort Bolvar where the military have control and there's no media anywhere near there. Anyway, he sees his camera. He skipped the entire hole so he wouldn't go anywhere near the photographer. Instead, the White House released its photo of the day. They didn't want a photo of him golfing. They released a photo of him that morning talking with, a, with an aide about hurricane preparedness. They, they released their own photo of him on the phone talking to FEMA. I, can't, I think it might have been FEMA or another hurricane preparedness, uh, briefing, telling people what to do, uh, anything but putting on his golf shoes. Now, you don't see anything in these shots you don't see golf clubs in the background. You don't see the cart waiting to take them for a round of golf. Uh, a photojournalist in the room might have take, taken a different or a broader view. It might have taken the same shot. But that's the way, one of the ways I think they manage the message. Uh, in all of this, the president, of course, is the leading man. I mean, whatever else they do with Twitter, with AIDS, with press briefings, uh, social media, Facebook, Ultimately, the main thing they have is, is Barack Obama, the president. But even his role is changing a lot lately. Um, the first thing he does, he's taking many fewer questions from the press uh, in press conferences than his predecessors. Martha Joint Kumar uh, is the expert on tracking the president's relationship with the news media. She's a professor at uh, Towson State uh, University. She's written a book, uh, an excellent book, called Managing the President's Message. She works in the briefing room with us and goes to every briefing and charts the number of questions the press secretary asks, the president asks, uh, is asked. Uh, she's just an excellent source. As of April, uh, uh, Barack Obama has taken questions from the press and public a total of 130 times. Now, at the very co exact comparable point, that's less than half what George W. Bush had done. He had taken questions 301 times. Now, this is formal press conferences plus the, the short sessions, like in the Oval Office, where they'll take questions, two or three or four questions from the press pool. But they're in public, in front of other reporters. It's just a quarter of the total of Bill Clinton at this stage of his presidency, who, no surprise, Bill Clinton loved to talk. Interestingly, it rivals Ronald Reagan. Very similar, 130, 118. And Ronald Reagan's low total was when he was ducking Sam Donaldson by walking out to the helicopter all the time like this. That 118 doesn't count him not hearing Sam Donaldson yelling out a question. One thing Barack Obama does like is he likes interviews with the news media, with some members of the news media. That's one of the ways they get their message out. 
He has so far, through April, according to Martha's uh, calculations, given 306 interviews. Now that's, that's a lot more than George W. Bush, who uh, didn't like the news media particularly much. Uh, it's more than any of the recent presidents. Interestingly, uh, it's the first time a president has done a majority of his interviews to television, as opposed to print or other uh, sources. Uh, one of the reasons it's, uh, people speculate why he likes, why Barack Obama likes interviews more than press conferences or open questions is it's more controlled. Uh, it's more conversational. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, he can go on longer. He also can pick a single outlet, uh, the, net, the TV networks, for example. Uh, I could speculate maybe they also like to reward friends, punish enemies. Not sure that happens. Some people think it does. Uh, at one point in his first year, 20%, one out of five of all of his newspaper interviews went to one newspaper. And everyone else had to compete for the rest. Uh, and then finally, there are speeches where he stands on a stage and, and delivers speeches and formal remarks. On that, he's pretty much standard, uh, fitting the modern standard, very similar. 1,105 so far through April, very comparable to George W. Bush, Bill Clinton. Interestingly, though, that those, that modern standard is almost twice uh, what Ronald Reagan did. And, and people thought he, Ronald Reagan was a great communicator. He just spoke a lot less. So how great is Barack Obama? Is he a great communicator? I look at one recent study. Over the summer, if you recall, they fought in Washington for about four weeks over raising the debt ceiling. It was a very engaged fight. Uh, and Barack Obama spoke a lot. July 11th, he came out and had a press conference and he talked about the need to raise taxes. Millionaires and billionaires can afford to pay a little bit more, he said. Four days later, he had another press conference. Now, this is unusual because, as you know, remember, he doesn't have a lot of them. Four days later, he's another one. He says, we need to raise revenues. Millionaires and billionaires. Four days after that, he came out to the White House briefing room and said, we've got to have additional revenue. Three days after that, July 22nd, he went to Maryland in the town hall and said, we, we can't do this with spending cuts alone. We need more revenues. The same day, he came back to the White House, went in the briefing room and said, if you don't have additional revenues, you're going to do this all on the backs of the poor. Three days after that, he spoke to the nation from the East Room and said, how can we uh, slash funding for education before we ask people like me to give up tax breaks? So that's one two, three, four, five, six times in about two weeks he came out. July 29th, he finally goes out and gives a status report. It's the first time in all these appearances he did not mention taxes. Well, what was the impact of all these appearances? According to Gallup, the president's approval on the economy dropped 11 points between May and August. According to Gallup, the president's approval on the deficit dropped eight points during that time period. He didn't move the numbers. They actually moved against him. Finally, three days after, two days later, he announced the deal with Congress, and there were no revenues. He didn't get what he wanted. So what happened? Barack Obama can be a great communicator. Well, we've seen it. I mean, he came to our attention in 2004 with a, an inspiring, soaring rhetoric uh, a speech, rather, at the Democratic National Convention. In the fall of 2007, when he was really struggling to overtake Hillary in the Democratic primaries. He gave a speech to the Iowa Democratic Party in Des Moines that just uh, brought them out of their seats and really started to push him ahead for the first time. In March of 2008, in the primaries, again locked in battle with Hillary, he uh, got, uh, got uh, caught in that uh, mess with his preacher, Jeremiah Wright. He gave a speech on race in Pennsylvania that helped save his campaign. And I think last uh, fall, or last winter, uh, in the memorial service in Arizona after Gabrielle Giffords was shot, I thought his speech uh, uh, stirred people. Uh, but those are exceptions, and, and they've been very few since he took office. His inaugural dress, when he had two million people on the mall, people, I would argue, were ready to march into Congress and demand enactment of legislation, at, ready to do his bidding. I, I challenge anyone to remember a single line from that speech. It did not have any of FDR, 1933, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. It had none of John F. Kennedy's ask not what your country can do uh, call to service. 
It was deliberate and cautious. He is a very deliberate speaker, uh, cautious even. Um, he speaks slowly. He pauses often uh, in mid-sentence as though he's searching for the exact right word. And the result, interesting, is, because I have to write stories on what he says, is that when you read it, you read the text afterward, the transcription, to the eye, he speaks in sentences. Not many of us do. He not only speaks in sentences, he speaks in paragraphs. He, if you read it afterward, he, he, they're just perfectly constructed. But to the ear, it can be slow, halting, uh, almost a monotone. Dan Fiver, his communications director, told me, at his very core, the president is a writer. He speaks like a writer, which is why when you read the transcripts, he said, it reads in complete paragraphs. He takes his words very seriously and he's very thoughtful. He denied that it, it, it had any ill effect on his speaking ability. Dan thinks he's a terrific speaker, but he did concede it's born of thoughtfulness, not trepidation. At that critical uh, Iowa dinner in 2007 when he was struggling against Hillary uh, early, he found out he would not have a teleprompter at this big gathering of uh, very influential Democrats. And he, and he told aides he would memorize it, his speech, quote, so it's crisp and delivered powerfully. I need to step it up. A few weeks later, or I'm sorry, back in the end of the primaries, he was heading to the Texas primary, and he was starting to get a little confident. David Pluff, his uh, campaign strategist, later wrote, Obama, quote, wanted the race to be over more than he wanted to win it, and it showed in his day-to-day -day performance. Barack Obama is not immune to mistakes either. We, a lot of us uh, enjoyed a few laughs over the years at George W. Bush's <laughs> Uh, adventures with the English language, and it was President Bush who himself once said, my mouth is where words go to die. Uh, he had a lot of fun with that. Uh, Barack Obama is not uh, George W. Bush, don't get me wrong, but when he's off script, when he's off the teleprompter, or when he's tired, he can make mistakes. Uh, he made fun of the Special Olympics once on Jay Leno. He didn't, he, he lived to regret that. There's the infamous one during his campaign when he was caught on tape, a tape he didn't know was running, telling donors that rural whites without jobs, quote, get bitter, cling to guns or religion, or antipathy to people who aren't like them. Uh, later on in the White House at a press conference, inc incidentally, the White, the White House press conference where he accidentally uh, kind of called on me and had to say shame on me for standing up. The last question of that press conference was about an altercation in Boston between a white policeman and a black professor, and the president's reaction was that the police acted stupidly, a comment he later had to say he regretted and, and had to uh, spend a couple days uh, fixing the damage. Barack Obama is overexposed by almost any definition. He speaks too much. They don't think so at the White House. They think that they have to use him to cut through this cluttered media landscape that so many of us get our information from so many sources, whether it's uh, um, John Stewart on the Comedy Channel or it's a newspaper or it's Twitter, that you need to put the president in each one of those or people aren't going to get his side of the story. Uh, but the result is um, uh, he has reduced impact. You know, they, they all want to be FDR. All these presidents, they, 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 if they don't want to be Ronald Reagan, they, they think this is the model of the presidential communicator. And they, they think the model is the fireside chats, Franklin D. Roosevelt talking to the country, the country stopping to listen to what the president said. But the fact is, FDR didn't actually talk that much. FDR had just 30 fireside chats. He never had more than four in a single year. Several years, he only had one. In 1942, one of his closest supporters really liked one of them, thought this was the ticket, man. He was just getting the country rallied for war, and wrote to him and said, you need to do more of these. FDR wrote him, quote, sometimes I wish I could carry out your thought of more frequent talking, but the one thing I dread is that my talk should be so frequent as to lose their effectiveness. I think we should avoid too much personal leadership. Finally, I, I talked to a, a public relations expert in New York who counsels CEOs, corporate CEOs, does not do any political work. And we talked about Barack Obama 
and the notion that giving more speeches uh, will, will move the numbers. And he said the problem is they confuse a silver tongue with a silver bullet. They won the presidency, I'm paraphrasing now, and they, so they think they can win all these arguments, but they're not winning them. Just this last week, since he gave the joint, uh, joint uh, session of Congress speech on the jobs bill, he's gone out on the road. He has said by one account, I think on Politico this morning, that he said the phrase, pass the bill, I think 18 times. Now, our McClatchy reporter, colleague of mine, wrote yesterday, he also has been telling people, call Congress. You know, we need to put the pressure on, and Congress told us their calls have not gone up by one. It's, it's just not getting through. That's kind of my summary. I, I say all that with the acknowledgement he's still a much better communicator than I am. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions you have. I have a quick question. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I have to remind people to please use the microphone. If you do it from the microphone, I'm going to be able to hear you. Or I'm going to stand up and answer the wrong question like I did at that White House press conference. I'm sorry, it's a pleasure to have you with us, and uh, I just uh, wish everyone would give you a nice round of applause first. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, and uh, my, the only question that I have is that why, wh why was it, do you think, that uh, in terms of the White House message machine, that when there clearly were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and Saddam Hussein, why was it that Saddam Hussein, I mean, it was, it was being almost obsessively uh, I guess forced by the president to say to the American people that Saddam Hussein has a, there's a direct link between Saddam Hussein and the war on terror in 9-11. And clearly after George Bush left office, there was no link between them at all. So why do you think that White House message machine, or why do you think that message came across as it did, and you can see how it affected you know, the rest of history, so can you talk a little bit about the White House message machine and the George Bush assertion that Saddam Hussein did have weapons of mass destruction? Uh, thanks. I, I'd be delighted to. Uh, my quick take, and uh, believe me, all of my colleagues back in our Washington office will thank you for that question, because there was one news organization uh, that didn't follow the White House message on that, and it was my colleagues at Ben Knight Ritter who reported skeptically about the White House claim of weapons of mass destruction. Not me, but my colleagues. Uh, and they did that by not taking the news from the White House. Uh, one of the advantages or disadvantages of being a news organization like a chain of newspapers from outside New York and Washington, which is what I, I write for newspapers in Miami and Anchorage and Kansas City and Fort Worth, White House tends not to care about us. They tend to want to talk to people in New York. So they leak those stories or give those stories to papers in New York or Washington, and they run them, that Saddam has weapons of mass destruction. We talk to generals and colonels and majors and sergeants and CIA analysts uh, around the country or outside of Washington and sometimes come up with a different story. Uh, I disagree with your summation, though, that it wasn't known that he didn't have weapons of mass destruction until after he left office. I think it was pretty widely known by 04. Anything else? Yes, please. Um, so when, uh, when, a president is, when the president is at a, a news conference with so many correspondents attending, how does he decide who to call on and, and uh, you know, what questions? Well, first of all, who to call on? And over, you know, over a number of these press conferences, how does he decide whether he's called on people um, uh, equitably, you know, when you know ha that that some people have gotten their a question answered once in a while or not. Uh, it's a great question. It's an interesting mechanic. You know, it's changed in the last couple presidents. Up till Ronald Reagan, they would actually come in and just point at people who were raising their hands. I remember in the Reagan White House, a lot of reporters read that Nancy Reagan liked red, so a lot of reporters started wearing red thinking he would get the president's eye and he'd call on them. And then over time, uh, we got to this scripted arrangement. Uh, it started with the Clinton White House, Bush did it. They, people would raise their hands, they'd, they'd call on people, but the reality is they had a list by then. Uh, Ari Fleischer in the Bush White House just said, I, 
You know, Obama doesn't even have the pretense of people raising their hand, but Bush started that too. How they do it is, first of all, they call in the Associated Press first by tradition. The senior wire service reporter gets called on first. They take an average now of about 13 questions a press conference. Uh, they usually try to call on several of the networks, the TV networks, because that's their biggest audience. And then they rotate. Some of it is who the press secretary may think has been overlooked for a while. Some reporters lobby. Uh, some reporters email and ask, you know, you haven't called on me in a long time. Please call on me. Um, there are various efforts that go into that. I think sometimes it's based on subject. I know uh, in May of 2010, the press conference, I asked him a very, I thought a very good question about the oil spill, and I, most more importantly, I think I got a good answer. I'd been asking a lot of oil spill questions around the White House, so I think that put me on the radar that when they were going to talk oil spill, they wanted to call on me. Uh, we were particularly interested because we have a lot of papers along the Gulf Coast. Uh, so sometimes it's subject matter, and sometimes it's internal politics. They do rotate. I wish they'd just call on more people. I went back recently and watched the John F. Kennedy press conference, and it was remarkably different, uh, largely because he gave shorter answers, sometimes 10 words. And so he jumped around a lot. I mean, I, 20, 30 people got questions in. Uh, I'll just say, you didn't ask it, but one more point. It's interesting how we sit there. Nobody knows in advance how you're going to get called on most of the time. So you have to have more than one question ready, because if you have only one question, the reporter before you might ask it then the president may call on you and you'll look like an idiot if you just say, how you doing? So most of us will have six to eight questions, and then as every other reporter is going before you, you've got to cross them off and reorder what you're going to ask. So if you hear flipping a paper, it's because we, we're all thinking about what will we ask if we get called on. Occasionally, the press secretary will email you in advance and say, you may be called on today. I had one recently. I was on the road on a campaign trip covering the Republican campaign, and we got an email asking, uh, will you or your partner be in the seat today? So I, I have a new partner, and I messaged her. I said, that, by the way, that means you're going to get called on. <laughs> so she, I think she added a few more questions to her Rolodex, because you don't know if you're going to get called on first or last. Next, please. You uh, started your talk about uh, media bias in a rather lighthearted way. Could I ask you, in a more serious vein, your comments on either actual or perceived media bias, and could you be any more specific about various networks? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm comfortable talking about my, co my, my competitors. Uh, I, I, I can certainly talk about myself, but I, oh, what the heck. Yeah, I mean, of course there's bias in the media. I, that'd be silly to deny it. I mean, everyone has a point of view. Everyone. Even if you write a story 100% objective and it simply says the president said X and the, uh, the other party said Y in response, what story you pick to write betrays a bias. You may be interested in Iraq or the Middle East peace process and not as interested in tax policy. That's a bias. Uh, we only can write so many stories a day. But I, I mean, I think there is a bias. Uh, I think most journalists, and I think the standard still, the objective, the goal, of most journalism news organizations I know is still to try to be fair. I hope that as long as we try to be fair and open-minded, uh, we'll, we'll end up closer to that than anything else. I find a new model growing up, particularly on cable TV, uh, where the, the goal is not. The goal is to say, I am for one point of view or I am for this other point of view, and all of our reporting will flow from that. I, I, that's not the standard I was raised with, and I, I hope most of us don't do that. Is that at all helpful? I, I won't, I just, I'm not going to talk about individual networks. I understand. Have you written your book yet? No, no, and, and, and even my wife wouldn't read it. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, I was impressed with the uh, early comments about the deluge of information and tweets and, uh, that you get. What strategies do you use to, to filter through all that? Uh, do you just ignore it all, or, or how do you handle that kind it's of a It's a terrific flood? question. It's a ter you cannot read it all. I mean, I, the amount I just get from the White House, which doesn't count what I get from Congress, and I want to know what the Speaker of the House says, because he's commenting on presidential. First of all, I pay attention to the principles. The President, the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader, the Vice President. Everyone below that is a secondary tier. They'd have to do a cabinet member. It's hard for them to rise to the level of our attention. On the emails, I, I ignore a lot of them. 
uh, just can't read them all. I try to read from interest groups occasionally, think tanks, you know, uh, trade associations. They got to get it all in the headline of the email, the slug line, or if I can't, I just don't have time to open them. Uh, it's it's their challenge to get it onto our radar screen. When I was uh, took my one journalism class many many years ago in Chicago, we had a. Uh, uh, a reporter from the Chicago Daily News come and his advice was never be afraid to talk to kooks because you never know where that great, st they may be right once in a while and I, I, I tried to keep that in mind but with email I'm getting I don't know, 500 of them a day. <laughs> so it's a challenge. And I go to the White House briefing every day when I'm in Washington. I have a partner so when I'm here she's doing it or I'm doing a lot of the Republican campaign stuff now and we're having to work that uh, schedule but I listen to what the press secretary says every day. I have two short questions. The first is, as a historian, I, I'm a historian, and I am appalled at the amount of photoshopping that's being done to photos. And it worries me about the accuracy of history in terms of looking back at events and people and what they did. I'm wondering if there's anything that you um, in the media can do about it or say it or make more people aware that these photos are not necessarily accurate all the time. And then secondly, I wonder if uh, you could mention any lessons or ripples that went through the press corps after the Helen Thomas situation. Uh, on the first, I, I'm not sure, particularly at the White House, if there's anything we can do. We pressure them constantly to get uh, journalists in the room. I'm not talking about in the National Security Council where they're, they're planning to, say, you know, to kill bin Laden. We understand we're not going to be allowed in that. Uh, but, but bill signings in the Oval Office, I mean, they're not allowing. And I, I, I would prefer it if a newspaper person's in there too, but, but no photographers. And photo every president's liked photographers. Uh, they're shutting more and more of them out. And we just, I'm part of the White House Correspondents Association. We meet regularly with the press secretary. And we, we lobby and pressure and cajole, try to put public pressure. This talk tonight is a little part of that public pressure on the White House. I hope the candidates running for president are asked uh, to commit to this kind of transparency in the future. Uh, and put them on the record now, uh, whether it's Barack Obama in a second term or it's Rick Perry or Mitt Romney or Michelle Bachman. I'd like them all on the record right now. I, I don't worry so much about Photoshopping. I, there's a little personal trust. I think, as I said, Pete Souza, Chuck Kennedy, these are people I know, a lot of us know as former journalists. I think they're reputable people, but it's the cropping. I don't consider that the same. I, I don't think they're changing the, the content within the photo. And I like, I like the Reagan picture without all the things. That's photoshopping. That's well, oh, they cropped it. Yeah, they cropped. They cropped out stuff. You know, we don't know what else is in that picture. And a photojournalist would, would have a, a more critical eye. Uh, in terms of Helen Thomas, I think the general reaction in the press corps was uh, it was a sad thing. Uh, she had increasingly, you know, when she had become a columnist several years before this uh, comment on the White House driveway about Israel and was increasingly giving her opinions, which is what columnists do. And uh, there are columnists in the press briefing room, right and left. I mean, that exists, but most of the people in the briefing room are as I say, they hold to this standard, the goal of fair, objective reporting. They're not columnists. Yes, please. Well, this may be a reiteration of a previous question, but I'm going to ask it anyhow. Um, you've described a press office that's putting forth a very strongly censored message on the president, showing the presidency and the president in a very positive light. And that was true of the previous presidency also. So. What I want to know is, what do you do personally to get at the truth of the message, or what's behind the message, or beside the message the White House is putting out? I'm sorry, what do I do personally to get to the truth? Yeah, the whole story. I work hard. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all do. I, I think there are, there are concentric circles around a presidency. There's the most, the tight inner circle of senior advisors who aren't necessarily not telling us the truth, but they're certainly not telling us the whole truth. Then there's a broader circle of people they interact with, and that can be cabinet members, members of Congress they've negotiated with, people who were in the room with the president or vice president. We have to interview them. As we found during this debt wrestling match over the summer, 
often the White House came out and said, here's exactly what happened, and then we'd go to the, talk to John Boehner and he'd say, well, no, no, that's not what happened. We said something very different. So you've got to reconcile. Sometimes they're irreconcilable because we weren't in the room. Then there's third layers where people they talk to. I think we have to talk to all of those people about big decisions in the presidency. Could you comment on the, um, I guess, the changing economics for news organizations covering the president, covering uh, campaigns? I'd be happy. It actually goes a little bit to the, to the previous question about what do we do to get to the truth. We have less money to cover the presidency than we used to. Newspapers, it's no surprise, don't sell as many newspapers uh, as we used to, and we don't have as many department stores buying ads or car dealers buying ads. I urge you all, buy a couple hundred thousand copies of the paper tomorrow. <laughs> Open a department store, buy some ads. It would help the country. Uh, but short of that, we have less money to, to travel with the president. But it's not just us. The networks, the TV networks, have less money to travel with the president. Uh, we can't afford, we pay our expenses when we travel with the president. We charter a plane. We can't do it as much as we used to. We don't do it anywhere near as much as we did when I covered Bill Clinton, when we had a charter plane on every trip. Uh, so we're not always there to talk with the people who he's talked to. We can always see what the president says. It's on TV. It's on WhiteHouse.gov. As a, if I didn't make myself clear, they will tell us what he said. They will stream it live. They'll send us Flickr photos. They'll send us video. They'll send us transcript. But to talk to the people he talked to, we have to go. We have less money to do that. So it's a challenge. Uh, one of the other things that's changing, and I talked a little bit about this at the uh, luncheon in Washington, the National Press Club luncheon, where they handed out the, the Ford uh, Presidential Foundation Awards. The effect of the Internet on journalism is changing journalism. Uh, a lot of people are writing shorter. They're writing blogs. They're writing two paragraphs instead of 2,000 words. They're writing a tweet of 24 characters instead of a sentence. Uh, there's a rush to be first just to get a little tidbit out there. And, uh, and there's not as much time, resources, or readers for longer, thoughtful analysis of the presidency. Uh, I think it's great the Ford uh, Library, the Ford Presidential Foundation, uh, chooses to honor work that tends to dig a little deeper uh, and look at these things in a little more depth. But there is less of that today than there used to be. Anyone else? Thank you for coming to Ann Arbor and sharing your views on Washington. Thank you for having me. I had me. the pleasure many, many years ago when I was working for WUOM of attending one of John Kennedy's uh, private briefings were selected people who were invited to Washington, educational radio broadcasters and so forth. It was a very interesting experience to see how those are staged and uh, how effective he was as a communicator. That's my personal interest there. But my question to you is about polls. How big a pool of people are polled? I'm sorry, I couldn't have The polls we read about the president's approval rate and all these other polls we read about so often? Right. How many people are in the body that are being polled? How many people are polled yeah, in a sample? About 100,000. How, how is that done? Can you give us a, kind of a background on that polling process today? Sure. Uh, we poll, McClatchy polls with Marist College. We have uh, both national polls and polling of states. Uh, we've polled for years with other pollsters. The standard sample size for a national poll is six to 800 people, and that gives you a margin of error of about 3%. Uh, interestingly, if if you add another 200, 500, the margin of error doesn't shrink that much. And it's just a statistical fact, one I can't understand, but I accept, that if you call random digit dialing around the country, 800 people, you're going to get a sample that 95% of the time is going to be right within three percentage points. It's but about 800 people on a national poll. Uh, larger, if you need a large subsample, like if you want Hispanics, you're going to have to pull a lot more people. Uh, we find it's costing more money because we have to call cell phones. Good polls call cell phones, which you cannot do by computer. When I say random digit dialing, a polling operation uh, has a computer that dials the phones for you. It's programmed in. We need calls from the west, south, the northeast, the midwest, uh, different area codes, but by law they can only dial uh, hard lines to dial a cell phone, you need someone to actually dial it. And so it's much more labor intensive and expensive.
but young people particularly use only cell phones. And young people skew a little differently politically uh, than older people. So our, we poll cell phones. Good polls will look at this when you read a poll and see if they, they call cell phones. Those who don't tend to skew a little more Republican. Anything else? What's your average day like? Can I ask what my average day was like, and, and will the Tigers win the World Series? Uh, he didn't ask about the Tigers, but as an as a American League Central fan, I'm ready to concede the White Sox are not going to win. The Tigers are going to win the division. They are going to win the American League. Verlander's the greatest pitcher this year. They're, they're closing great. My average day, after checking the White Sox loss to the Tigers four in a row this week, um, you know, there is no average day because uh, I travel a lot. But the elements of my day include uh, I check online in the morning. I check the BlackBerry first thing for emails, and, and I don't check the tweets as much as I should. But I check emails from the White House, from colleagues, 6, 7 in the morning. Uh, I have to check the schedule. If I have the duty with my partner to cover the White House that day, I have to be at the briefing because uh, that's every day that the president's in town, the White House press secretary briefs. Any event the president's doing in Washington public, I will go to. I like to lay eyes on him, even though his words are available in a multitude of ways, I'd still like to see him every time I can. Um, and then I spend time on the phone. Even if you're at the White House, you can't talk to anybody except the press staff. You can't talk to anyone on the National Security Council staff or the Office of Management and Budget. You just can't walk around, so you have to actually call them. You're sitting there, but you have to call them. And, or email them. Increasingly, they like to email. So then you're trying to get people to tell you more about what the president's doing, either to explain it from the White House perspective, find out what the political prospects So we're calling Congress. Then we're calling analysts to analyze it and find out if it's true, will it work, is that a smart idea. That's the average day in Washington. Uh, I travel a lot. I'm doing the campaign. So right now, the Republican campaign is really uh, going. So I spend some of my time on logistics. I spent an hour in my hotel room today making hotel plans for the Iowa caucuses in January, working on charter plane plans with the White House Correspondents Association, and planning my trip to Orlando next week for a Republican debate. It, it, it's labor intensive. There's a lot of logistics. Uh, you know, partly because the candidates won't tell you a week in advance where they're going to be. They won't tell you often. There's a new thing. They won't tell you eight, ten hours sometimes. I think some of this is a new phenomenon. They're all afraid of the other party finding out where they're going to be and sending videographers to catch them saying stupid things. They also don't want the rest of us catching them saying anything. Uh, so you call and say, is the candidate going to be in South Carolina next week? They said, well, we have nothing for you on that. Well, okay, then I have nothing to write about your candidate. I'm going to write about Rick Perry. I mean, that's the consequence of it. That's kind of the elements of the average day. I try to get lunch every day. I, in fact, I never miss lunch. It's, it's a sad but true fact. Thank you. so much. This was fascinating. We had a delightful dinner conversation, and uh, this amplified even more. So I, I know you'll enjoy talking to Stephen in the lobby. We have a couple of pens for you, signed by Gerald R. Ford, our favorite president. Wow. And we hope you will write with him in good health. Thank Great. you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Before we close, I would like to uh, do a commercial for what's coming up this fall. If you didn't already do so, pick up a flyer before you leave. This was program number one, and there are four more to come. And in fact, we have uh, one more we were working on. We have an invitation out to Jim Lehrer, who has a new book out, and haven't been able to schedule that yet, but we'll, that may not happen this fall, but we'll, we'll keep working on him for the next, next uh, uh, year coming. Uh, but we have next week a program on Wednesday, uh, the author of a, a book on the oil kings and talking about oil policy in the Middle East during the Ford administration and beyond. Uh, that'll be Wednesday. Our 30th anniversary is this year, and Andrea Mitchell, who is the chief foreign affairs correspondent for NBC News, will be coming here to help celebrate with us. 
Uh, we're hosting the Consul General of Canada, Roy Norton, who will be talking about U.S.-Canadian relations and also about the bridge. If you're at all interested in trade issues, uh, he's very, very knowledgeable about trade issues in general between our two countries, and uh, it will be fascinating to see what's happening at that point about the Detroit International River Crossing that's uh, being discussed right now. And then on December 8th, we're going to invite you to come to watch a new documentary on Senator Arthur Vandenberg. Hank Meyer of the Meyer family and Meyer Stores um, is an, an, uh, an amateur historian of significance, and he has... Uh, He's working on a book that's not quite done, but he's, he, in conjunction with another person from Grand Rapids, a producer, has a new video, a documentary on Arthur Vandenberg. And so we're going to have popcorn in the Ford Library that night. Uh, but out in the lobby, we have a reception for you. We have information about the Friends of Ford organization, which is, of course, the source for supporting and making these programs possible. If you're not on our email list and would like to be so, please fill out a form and we'll add you to that. And we're glad to have you here tonight. And please enjoy talking to our guest, Stephen Thoma. Thank you so much for coming here.